Say your question again, and then yes. we'll flow into the conversation. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you for coming on Flora Funga podcast. And I guess I just wanted to um, ask you who you are and kind of why you wrote Mycorrhizal Planet. Well, my name's Michael Phillips, and I am an apple grower up in northern New Hampshire. And for the last 30 plus years, I've been pursuing, you know, how can I grow fruit organically? But actually taking that question a little bit deeper and, and really wanting to understand the biology. Mm. And along the way, I got introduced to the notion that apple trees have fungal partners in the soil. And in fact, you know, almost all plants have fungal partners in the soil. And you'd hear a little bit about that with respect to, so it's a good idea to inoculate a root system. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really understand a lot of it. And, and I have this inquisitive nature. And, and I thought, knowing that these fungi, these mycorrhizal fungi are so important, I want to write a book and go deep with it so that I can come out on the other side and tell growers the important parts. So it, it, it was just a natural flow for me to, I've written a book called The Apple Grower, another one, The Holistic Orchard, mm -hmm. a book with my wife, Nancy, about herbal medicine called The Herbalist Way. Um, mm -hmm. Mycorrhiza Planet is my fourth book. Okay. And in it, um, I explore the fungal realm, the specific fungal corner of the kingdom <laughs> that has to do with mycorrhizae. And that word mycorrhizal, um, the Greek roots, myco, the fungal kingdom, rhiza, the, the roots of plants. And, and it's the union, it's, it's the two coming together that performs all these incredible things um, to make life on earth possible. So mm. the plant piece is very, very important. Right. You know, we will talk about the fungi, but it, it's really that union. I can't emphasize yes. that much. Yes, enough. it's the connection. I love that. So then what would be like some history on mycorrhizae? How did uh, you think it come about or how did people, I guess, learn about it? Well, if, if we go back 450 million years ago, um, that's a big chunk of time. <laughs> our planet was a, a water planet. Okay. And as the ocean started to recede, and the first rock surfaces were revealed, there were tidal pools. Mm -hmm. And in those tidal pools were the ancestors of vascular plants. So think, think of those as algae. And, and they didn't have root, they could photosynthesize, but they didn't have this ability to get their feet into the soil. Right, right. And in the same tidal pools were oceanic fungi through whose filaments they could absorb nutrients and minerals the fungi didn't have the ability to photosynthesize and make get carbon energy to get mm -hmm. the sugars. And so over the course of time, the plant ancestor and the original fungal species made a surrogate deal that the fungal hyphae would serve as roots, which the plants would eventually evolve to have those roots. Right. But, but that pact, so to speak, has carried forth to today where plants can certainly do the plant thing without the fungal partner, but they're not gonna be as strong, they're not gonna be as vibrant, they're not gonna be as robust. Right. And the fungal partner still needs that plant union to do its thing. These are fungi that committed to this partnership. And, and so as growers, when we, we understand this is the primary way that plants take up nutrition, you know, we, we, we've kind of fallen into this trap where for the last, hundred plus years, humans think of plants as sucking up NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, mm -hmm. potassium, and, and other minerals through the, the groundwater, through capillary action. And in truth, it is so much more involved. And, and um, right. plants absorb proteins, plants absorb fatty acids, plants absorb actual whole bacteria. And plants, right. of course, have this connection with the fungi, bringing wow. them nutrients. And, and once you start to realize that there's a lot of teamwork involved here, um, people refer to this as the soil food web. Mm -hmm. Some of your listeners may have heard of that term. Um, once you understand there's a lot of teamwork here and that there's many benefits to be had if you support that team, your job as a grower, as a human, <laughs> becomes a whole lot easier because 
plants and fungi know how to do it really, really well. Right. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, I, I like the connection and I feel like more people need to understand the importance of having both of the partners. So I agree with that. Um, so why are some, uh, what are some reasons why they are important? Uh, like the connection, like what can they do together compared to not? One, one, one way of looking at this is, I'll, I'll go back to the, the history of humans recognizing that this is going on. Right. I, I think that helps set the stage. Mm -hmm. So our eyes can see what are called ecto, E-C-T-O, mycorrhizal fungi. And these are the right. fungi that affiliate with trees in the forest, both hardwoods and softwoods. So mm -hmm. we, we can see that on their roots that there's this fungal mycelium in, mm -hmm. in the leaf duff. And it's, it's a type of mycorrhizae that came later than the, the tidal pool type. Um, these were fungal decomposers that struck up a surrogate root deal with the trees. Um, but th those are what we first saw as humans. Okay. So that, about the time of the Civil War, 1860, 1880s, in that period, um, there were some scientists who said, you know, I don't think this is just like a disease or, or a sickness for the roots there's actually a beneficial thing going on mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're talking, what, 140 years ago, um, our first notion that this yeah. might be good. It took us a long time, us, the human, to understand this is really, really good. Uh, and that's because we're, we're coming, going back to that time period. We mostly didn't know what microbes were. We, right. we had just in, in microscopes that we could see bacteria and algae and protozoa and, and nematodes, but, but not in a deep way. Um, 1918, the uh, Spanish flu epidemic would come and, and kill somewhere between 50 and 100 million human beings. Wow. And we didn't know that was caused by a virus. I mean, right. flash forward to today and we're all like <laughs> having <laughs> all, right. all kinds of viral recognition. Right. Um, but 100 years ago, we didn't even know that. Yeah, and true. you know, I, I often will say to people, as far as understanding the fungal realm and, and, and how all this comes together, we're at kinder we're in kindergarten at best. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much more to learn. Anyway, yeah, so excited. In the 1920s, a man named Rudolf Steiner over in Austria gives a series of lectures. Um, this is what biodynamic farming is based on, okay. and then and that's kind of in the group of, I'd, I'd call it almost spiritual organic farming. Anyway, okay. Steiner talks about this common root being, how the roots of plants mesh and they form partnerships. And he, he, he's aware of the fungal element as the glue that's doing this. Mm -hmm. But I, I like that term that he came up with, common root being. Because today, when you walk down and out in my orchard and, and you see apple trees and there's some pears here and some plums here and some pie cherries, etc. And there's grasses and there's clovers and mm -hmm. there's all kinds of different herbal plants and there's some fruiting berries here or there. Uh, nice. It's a very diverse place. And okay. because of that plant okay. diversity, that in turn makes for a lot of fungal diversity. Right. And right. scientists will call what happens the common mycorrhizal network. And in that network, there can be as many as, let's say, about 50 different species of mycorrhizal fungi in a diverse plant ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And those fungi, the different species, have different skill sets. They're all pretty much uh, very good at bringing phosphorus to plants, but some of them will be the ones that bring nitrogen or calcium. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to bring the trace minerals, um, things like zinc and iron and molybdenum. And, and these are important elements for plants to use in their metabolic pathways to photosynthesize, to right. uh, create proteins, to create fatty acids. And, and the more robust metabolism is, the healthier the plant. What does a healthy plant do? It's able to resist insect pests and diseases. What do I want as a farmer? Right. Crops that are not gonna have issues <laughs> with deal. pests and diseases. <laughs> right. and, and if I take that whole big picture, and get back down there underground, have my mind understand that common root being, mm. that's where the magic happens because right. the fungi are bringing the plants balanced nutrition 
in trade for carbon energy. And, and plants are quite willing to sh uh, share some of their sugars that they produce through photosynthesis with the fungi because they're getting all these benefits. Yeah, how, how much do they share with um, like other fungi compared to keeping it for themselves? Well, what happens, the way to think about this is, mm -hmm. think about plant sap, protoplasm, cytoplasm, the juice that's inside yes. cells. And fungi have that juice, bacteria have that juice, plants have that juice. And the protoplasm is like the, the, the trading ground. Mm. So this fungal species through this root delivers, let's say zinc, but that particular plant doesn't really need that zinc. <laughs> And another fungi takes it back out to deliver it to a plant down the way that needs it. Okay. Uh, and this can all happen because the, the common currency, so to speak, is, is the protoplasm, the cytoplasm, okay. the plant sap. Oh, wow. And okay. so fungi might utilize some of these trace minerals, but they're, they're more focused on the carbon sugars. But even then the fungi will trade the carbon sugars mm. to the bacteria in the soil Okay. Because the bacteria have the ability to produce organic acids, and that can be utilized to dissolve bedrock, which the fungi mm -hmm. can then take some of these minerals up to the plant to trade for wow. the carbon sugars. So it's, it's, like a it's whole again, post. keep in mind, we're, we're in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, Our true. level of understanding of these things is, is just beginning, um, right. and it's, it's really fascinating. Wow. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, I don't know if you technically define mycorrhizae. Um, but I guess I want to, before we dive into far, kind of describe the different terms. So like, what is a mantle? What is ecto and endo um, cortex maybe in the roots? Um, stuff like that. So I, I have introduced the, um, the ecto mm -hmm. mycorrhizae that work with the trees of the forest. And, and the reason they have that prefix ecto is they don't actually penetrate the root cells but go into the intracellular spaces mm -hmm. and 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 so when you talk about a mantle that's kind of that mycelium that's penetrating in and forming what's called a hyphal net and, and you can get into these technical terms but it, it's it's kind of the root side of the fungal being and then beyond that it's hyphae those fine fine filaments mm -hmm form a mycelium to collect right. the nutrition. So that, that's kind of the aspects of the fungi. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about endomycorrhizal fungi, E-N-D-O, these are the species that go back to the tidal pools um, and they actually penetrate individual cells in the root cortex to make these deals. Mm -hmm. So they're in the intracellular space, but they also go into the actual cells and then when you see a picture of what's called an arbuscule, mm -hmm. which is a nutrient, trans, nutrient, nutrient transfer mechanism of the fungi, mm -hmm. um, that arbuscule looks a lot like a tree, or it looks like a mm -hmm. feeder root system, or it looks a lot like the, the alveoli in mm -hmm. our lungs Blanching. where we exchange oxygen. Um, in herbal medicine, you would learn this old, old concept called the doctrine of signatures. Mm -hmm. And in the doctrine of signatures, um, the human looks at the plant, where it grows, how it grows, maybe the shape of its leaf. And there, there's some suggestion of how you might use it. Mm -hmm. And when I look at a picture of an arbuscule, again, this is not something my eye can see without the aid of that microscope. Okay. Yep. And I see a tree or a feeder root system or like the lung uh, of the alveoli in our lungs exchanging oxygen. I see this very, very important connection to life forces itself. Mm -hmm. and, and the fungi are certainly in that grouping. Yeah. Uh, so that to me is the doctrine of signatures applied okay. to mycorrhizal fungi. But for, for our purposes, you know, um, those endomycorrhizae, they're not forming a mantle, they're going into the cells. Okay. But they yeah. also have that my those hyphae reaching out and that mycelium. And you might think of the endotypes as if, if my hand was a feeder root, extending the reach of that particular root to grab nutrients through the fungal hyphae as another three, four inches mm. all around it. Mm -hmm. And then when you 
complex that scenario with different plants with different fungal partners, and you're back to that idea of the common root being, the root system of a plant only accesses maybe 3% of the soil, which it's in. Hmm. But now with fungal partners, we're talking 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times more access to nutrients because that wow, mycelium yeah. is so vast and it's being shared among other plants. Another cool thing that distinguishes ecto from endo types. Mm -hmm. So the endo types, the arbuscule in the cell, mm -hmm. they affiliate with about 85% of the plants. So okay. if, if, if you're into a grass lawn or a pasture with <laughs> clover or you're your gardener or you're a flower gardener or you're an herb gardener or you're an orchardist like myself mm -hmm. uh, working with berries and other woodsy perennials that fruit all of those plants have endo partners okay the ectotypes which i said are related to the trees well they have hyphae that can reach as far as 12 feet down so this is where we get into that bedrock scenario oh wow yeah then in addition to that in between are certain groups of plants, the so-called soft hardwoods, things like willow and alder mm. and popple, that have both endo partners and ecto partners. Okay. And this is where a bridge essentially forms between that long reaching ecto realm, getting minerals from bedrock, the protoplasm, the sap of the willow, the alder, the popple, and, and other plants in this grouping mm. becomes a trading ground to send some of that valuable mineral that have been gotten from the bedrock into the endo systems. Mm. And, and this is how nature is, is, is like replenishing minerals up to the surface, up to the, where the plant action in, where, where photosynthesis takes place. Mm -hmm. We'll turn that off. <laughs> Try to turn it off. Okay. And now you better ask a question because it doesn't take much to distract me. <laughs> <laughs> so how how do these things uh, trigger or happen? Um, like, yeah, is there a specific trigger to set off an endo or ecto? Or how does a uh, plant species pick um, which type of pairing? Or do they always have multiple mycorrhizations? That's a loaded question, sorry. <laughs> Yes, plants can have multiple partners. Okay. Um, and how they determine you and I are good, we could tangle. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know. Um, so not not every species of mycorrhizal fungi is going to work with a apple tree, let's say, or okay. a clover. Mm -hmm. That's that's why we want a diverse ecosystem of plants because that's going to engender the diverse. Okay. Okay. Family that of makes sense. fungal species that are going to form that particular common root being. Okay. But it all begins basically with roots reaching out in the soil mm -hmm. and coming across a fungal spore that germinates in response to certain phytochemicals released by the root. And the fungal will penetrate into the root, and mm -hmm. that in turn will launch the partnership. Okay. Um, you know, similarly, an another way that this might take place is that the fungus in, a, in the garden with annual crops, um, it's gonna overwinter in the roots from mm. the year before. You know, okay. one of the best pieces of advice to give gardeners is stop pulling plants all out by yep, the roots because yep. in the roots that you're gonna carry the fungal future forward. Nice, oh, I like that. Okay, um, so yeah, do we know on like a molecular chemical level like what is happening with the exchange or are we a little far away from knowing that type of stuff well we you have a deep podcast here <laughs> <laughs> this we, is for my personal we interest there, but uh <laughs> we we do know that there's flavonoid signaling that terpenes okay. are involved we're, we're starting to unlock a little bit of that, uh, what is the exact phytochemical signal. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it really comes down to the proximity of a spore to a root. Um, okay. It has to get within about a quarter of an inch, maybe not even quite that far, for the germination to take place and then the union of that plant mm -hmm. with the fungus 
to be launched. Okay. You know, and, and that in itself is, an, is another good, one of those tidbits you pick up as you learn the science. Okay, as a gardener, starting my tomato plants and onions and what have you, by putting some spore inoculum, you can get commercial spore inoculum. Um, okay. Putting that in the potting soil means that you're putting the spores really close to where little seed sends off its right. first root. And you're launching that connection very early in your garden plant's life. Okay, yeah, like heightens the chances of even having a pair. Um, okay, so random question, but are wild type um, plants and cultivated plants, do they react differently to the same uh, fungus? if that makes any sense. So if something was grown in a lab compared to out in the wild, but it's the same plant species, would they pick up um, a different fungal species or would they act differently? My mind is going to, I, I wanna define kind of the, uh, the scope of the team. Okay. In the endomycorrhizal realm, the ones that form the Arby schools inside the root itself, mm -hmm. the ones that originated back in the tidal pool 450 million years ago. Um, there's only across the planet, maybe 400 species of endomycorrhizae. Oh, That's, okay. They reproduce asexually, but it's also an indication to me that you know nature got it right. Mm. This was not a partnership that had to completely reworking itself to figure out a new angle. Okay. On the other hand, the ectotypes, there's tens of thousands of those species. They reproduce sexually. Um, another thing about ecto is they're the ones that have fruiting bodies, mushrooms that pop right, up. Right, That's So when you see puff balls or you see go out and you're collecting bolites or mm -hmm. chanterelle mushrooms for your dinner, um, those are mycorrhizal fruiting bodies of specific species affiliated with specific trees. So back to the endotypes, you will find the same fungi in tropical and in savanna and in temperate and in boreal oh, ecosystems. Wow. And again, they have a, many, many different plant partners, mm -hmm. um, but, but they're very cosmopolitan with, as far as who they can deal with. Now your question to do with wild versus that's called domestic plants, whether right. it's in a lab or me working in the greenhouse with my tomato plants mm -hmm. that I wanna cultivate. Um, some of them, those species are going to be found in, in both settings. It's more okay. about the plant than the setting. Oh, okay. And I, I had mentioned the inoculum that you can buy commercially. Yeah. Um, things like mycorrhizal applications out of Oregon or bioorganics in Pennsylvania. These are companies that have seven or nine different species of endotypes. And, okay. and, and they're kind of like the, the all-stars, the heavy hitters, mm. the ones that are most likely to have something to contribute on a guest basis because you know we're not we don't know all the indigenous species that might affiliate with plants you live out in the, the plains somewhere in the central time zone i'm here in northern new hampshire okay. um but it's it's more about what which plant dances with which fungi mm -hmm. and us making sure there's enough diversity to cover as many bases as possible okay more so than it's like we know that if I'm going to grow wheat, I want this species of fungi. We don't know that. And in okay. fact, I mean, I'm asked that a lot. It's like, yeah. I want to grow this. So what fungi should I get? And it's like, wrong question. Yeah, diversity. You want to grow <laughs> this. You want to form a plant community that's very diverse. Mm -hmm. So you can have this diverse fungal mm -hmm. web. Okay. And a common root being that's going to be serving the needs of all the plants in that setting. You know, one of the things that comes out of, of studying the fungal connection and what plants and fungi have done together is learning that it's it's not so much a competitive world we live on and we mm -hmm. often tend to think, think that way um just the whole idea that if if i'm going to grow apples i spray herbicides to kill other plants so the apples yeah. get all the nutrients it's like that is so wrong mm. that's, that's that thought right there is the basis of why people have to then spray all these chemicals to grow food yeah. because they caused the problem in the first place by disconnecting the plant Very from true. its the tree from its plant partners. Mm -hmm. um, but as we start to understand earth and the way 
life came to be, it's more about collaboration and support networks. What the plants and fungi teach us is probably the most important lesson we need to learn as a species ourselves. We need yes. to collaborate more. We need to support each other, uh, well, to that. not be thinking it's all about competition. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not a sports game living on Earth. <laughs> it, it's, it's really a, a mutual symbiosis. Right. And if humans start to understand through the plants and the fungi, mm -hmm. we can apply that lesson in so many mm -hmm. deep, deep ways to make our own lives better and sustainable. Yeah, I like that. Uh, so you mentioned mycorrhizal application um, and like other companies. Do you also recommend somebody use or make their own um, application for farming? Or do you recommend usually going to certain companies for that if somebody wants to make So when own? I bring up those commercial products, mm -hmm. I am naming um, Root Rescue is another one up in Ontario okay. for the Canadians. Um, <laughs> I, I'm mentioning the companies that I know have the most diverse mix of inoculum products. Okay. And it, it's again, it's going to be on the order of, it may be as few as four, but it's more typically seven or nine species. So diversity is good, you know, just as yep. a general tenant, diversity is good. But you, yes, can also um, create your own spore resource by taking some native soil mm -hmm. from a healthy ecosystem around the roots of plants. Okay. And, you know, I like to ask permission to do this. It's like these beings have their own yes. realm, but I could bring that native soil back to where I planted a fruit tree okay. or mix it into my potting soil. Mm. And this is a totally hit or miss, you know, there'll be some root fragments, there'll be some spores in that soil right. that I'm mixing in. And that's gonna have there's going to be some fungi mm. mm -hmm. that are going to connect with the plants that I'm bringing it to. Okay. Similarly, you can also grow grasses. Grasses um, tend to have, so things like annual rye or Baha'i grass or Su Sudan grass okay. tend to have more multiple affiliations than other plants with different fungi. Mm. So by growing such a plant in a sack with a contained amount of soil volume, letting it go through its full cycle of growth and then dying back mm. um, either because of frost or, or drying out in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, those roots, the fungi in those roots, which you inoculated with some wild soil, will have grown 100 million spores, <laughs> produced 100 million spores in that volume of soil. And then you can utilize that in your garden or in your greenhouse Okay. Uh, or to restore a strip mined area. But oh, wow. as you get larger and larger in scale, you right. know, being able to purchase commercial inoculum probably mm. makes sense. Right, okay. The but but yes, they... you can do these things. Okay. And with a little bit of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be successful at it. I like that. Uh, so yeah, tell me a little bit more about your holistic approach with farming. Because I like that about um, your book and listen to you on some other podcasts as well. So well, I use this term holistic orcharding, mm -hmm. but it's, it's really a holistic approach to working with plants. Okay. And, you know, you're, you'll be familiar with the construct of organic farming, mm -hmm. uh, organic gardening. There were kind of the main idea is not using synthetic chemicals, but using natural materials to grow plants. But there's still sprays for pests and sprays mm -hmm. for diseases um and when you kind of recognize that moving beyond sprays for pests and sprays for diseases means working more with na nature how nature mm -hmm. makes it so that a plant isn't so palatable to a particular insect pest how nature builds an immune phytochemical response to rebuff diseases okay um, then you cross that line into what I call holistic growing. And it's all about supporting the systems. Hmm. So when I, I spray my orchard, you yeah. know, it, it, to anyone walking down the road, it's like, well, are chemicals in that tank? Or is it an organic spray mix? Well, in my spray mix is things like minerals, fatty acids from mm -hmm. seed oils, um, 
microbes, particularly lactic acid bacteria, uh, the fermenters, and other nutrients from herbal plant extracts that I okay. do. And what I'm doing is I am both providing nutrition to the plant, nutrition to the microbes in the soil, fatty acids that help support that biology on the surface of the plant, but also when they drip into the soil, they feed the mycorrhizal fungi. Mm. And by spraying more microbes, I'm creating a competitive environment where when a disease pathogen lands on a leaf, it doesn't really have a chance to outcompete its way in to get to the nutrient resources of the plant. So mm. it, it's a, a very complex topic, yeah. but that in a very quick way is an overview. And, and this, this is how I kind of came to this realization of, of the distinction between allopathic toxic ways of growing and holistic ways of growing. And, that, and that's because my wife, Nancy, mm -hmm. who was from Kansas originally, uh, got very interested in herbal medicine when I okay. became interested in organic fruit growing. So as I'm learning the ways of trees, she's spending time learning the ways of healing plants. And, oh, and that takes the form of going to conferences and becoming an apprentice to a well-known herbalist. In her mm. case, she studied and did a lot of work with Rosemary Gladstar, who's not too far from here. Okay. And she was learning about all these different plants, but also the remedies you could make from them. So you can mm. make tinctures, you can make salves, you can make liniments and, and you can make all kinds of medicinal teas. Okay. And you know, when someone's learning something, they want to practice. And yeah. often in the, in the herbal realm, um, it's, it's the woman who gets interested and she comes home with all this newfound mm. knowledge <laughs> and ability to make all these remedies. And she looks around and she sees this guy, I call him the herbal husband. And that was me in Nancy's case. And she starts, she started giving me remedies for conditions I didn't even know I had. And mm. I came to, and I was feeling better and I didn't yeah. even know I had a problem. All right. But uh, I was feeling better because my body systems were being supported. And, and, and that's where the light bulb mm. lit. And I realized to work holistically with human medicine, I could do that with the apple trees, with okay. the plants in my garden, and thereby boost their health, boost their mm. microbe friends, also boost balanced nutrition so that they were doing photosynthesis as robustly as possible. So I the see. metabolic pathway would go through all the stages of sugars, proteins, fatty acids, and eventually reach the end point, what are known as secondary plant metabolites, which I like to use the term resistance metabolites, but oh, that's yep. how plants resist disease. So okay. if you have a robust plant doing the green thing, mm -hmm. out in the sunshine, lots of photosynthesis, sending sugars to the fungi, getting nutrients in a balanced form, you have really unlocked the key to mm -hmm. growing healthy okay. in terms of producing food for people. That's right. also gonna be food that's much better for people and something that's been sprayed with fungicides and insecticides right. to the nth degree because that particular crop has all these problems because we broke away from nature's mm. biology, the right. fungal friends that are in the soil. Wow. Yeah, everything is so connected. And that's cool that you, I guess, started with your own health and then saw that you could compare it to uh, plants and, um, yeah, the ecosystem around it. I'm going to close my window real quick. There's a lot happening outside. Hold on so can you explain a little bit more about what fatty acids are and how that benefits the plants so back to the metabolic pathway of a plant sunshine sugars are produced nitrogens are brought up they are combined with uh, into amino acids to form proteins. If a plant is producing all complete proteins, insects are not going to be as interested in that plant. Okay. And then plants produce fat compounds, lipids, waxes. So some okay. of these are utilized to store energy for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. Some of these fat compounds go onto the surface of the leaf where they form a cuticle, which is the, kind of the waxy if you buff a leaf or, or right. you rub an apple. You're, oh, you're yeah. rubbing the waxes on the surface but those waxes help 
modulate water from coming out of the plant. Ah. They also protect it from rot organisms. Mm -hmm. So the more robust metabolism is, the thicker that cuticle will be and, and the more that plant can resist some of the situations that can come its way. Right, um, right. And fungi produce fatty acids. They feed on fatty acids. Mm. And so when I take seed oils of things like neem and garanja, or it could be hemp seed oil, okay. or in some applications, uh, I'll use dairy products. Uh, mm -hmm. whey. Interesting. I'm, I'm calling on those fat reserves yeah. as a way to feed the microbes so that they in turn can feed the plants. Got so I, I think that's a good exposure to the, the yeah. fat realm. But, but yeah, it's that goodness, part of the metabolic pathway that I'm just recognizing as very important and mm -hmm. I'm supplementing it. I'm trying to help engage further production of, of pro complete proteins and mm -hmm. fats because that that's what makes for a healthy plant. Right. What? So yeah, what did you start with? And then how long did it take you to kind of perfect your your mixture, if you would? Did you like, <laughs> did you experiment a lot yet. or? Okay. Um, in the holistic core recipe, mm -hmm which is kind of at the heart of it. And then there's riffs off of that. Okay. There is seaweed. So seaweed is something that contains um, all kinds of minerals and vitamins, but also the cytokine and hormone that, mm -hmm. that has great relevance to plant health. I utilize liquid fish and it okay. is, it's actually the fats in uh -huh. fish oils okay. that feed the biology, but liquid fish also introduces an element of nitrogen. Mm. And when I say liquid fish, I'm, I'm not talking about fish emulsion. I'm talking about fish hydrolysate. It's been cold processed, so the goodness <laughs> remains. Okay. I use neem oil and caranja oil. These mm -hmm. are seed oils from pretty much mostly from India, but these okay. are these are trees that grow in Southeast Asia. Neem is grown in Florida, California. It's 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 not part of my ecosystem, but it's, mm, right. It fits my um cosmology just like fair trade coffee um okay yep. it's, it's a very useful um oil pressed from these seeds that's been used in ayurvedic medicine and agriculture for thousands mm. of years i'm utilizing it here to partly provide those fats it provides other compounds as well um one of which is what are called azoduractins which impact the molting cycle of insects. So that's oh. something that helps me a lot with things like codling moth. Okay. Um, and then finally in this brew is what is known as effective microorganisms. And this is a culture of, of lactic acid bacteria and yeasts and some photosynthetic bacteria that I can activate. And so it's very economical. I feed it with blackstrap molasses. Oh, I get more microbes, but also the micro byproducts, the organic acids that, again, it's, it's all about feeding the microbial aspect of the plant realm, both in the soil and on the surface of the plant. Right, right. And that's how I'm going about this holistically. So it's, mm -hmm. I can describe it as those four or five simple ingredients but there's a lot much more complexity going on right? Um, and you can get into it and you can read the book holistic orchard and, and you'll learn a lot about about it perfect um, and more books are coming so awesome but that that and the gist is, is what the holistic approach kind of relies on at, at its heart okay that makes a lot more sense um so what are vocs and how do they work um with this well, my mind is wondering what is VOC, uh, volatile, the volatile um, organic, whoa. Uh, volatile organic compounds. Yes, uh, like the communications of like how the plants smell or, um, yeah. I, I can run with it now. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know those letters per se. Um, yes, plants definitely do communicate. And mm -hmm. they communicate through the fungal network with each other. You know, one. So, the, from our perspective, the plant produces a certain phytochemical or volatile oil compound. That's where I was going with the VOC idea. Got it. Um, that signals to somebody, to something, mm -hmm. that something is happening, that something is needed. And here's an example. Um, over here on this end of the garden. 
there's some vegetables being attacked by aphids. And so they're going to have a response to make themselves a little less palatable to the mm -hmm. aphid. But part of that phytochemistry is also going to go down through the roots as a signal, mm -hmm. be picked up by the mycorrhizal fungal partner in the protoplasm and carry to some other plants on the other end of the garden who are going to take that phytochemical signal and not necessarily beef up defenses for aphids, mm -hmm. but rather put out a call for beneficial insects like lacewings and oh, Japanese so cool. uh, Asian lady beetles that, you know, there's a situation developing here and you all might want to come in and join the party. <laughs> and and that, that's just one small example, yeah. but it, it's, it's amazing when you start yeah. to think about it's that, so complex. Um, that these different plants are communicating and letting each other know what's happening mm -hmm. and also to prepare and the, that preparation can take the form of, again, building up al alkaloids so a grazing animal doesn't maybe necessarily mm. want to eat this plant so much, but calling those beneficial insects. There's, there's many, many different types of signaling taking place. Yeah. And, and that's, that's part of the story of what's so fascinating here. Yeah, no, I, I love that. That's something that I want to look more into. And I, I'm really interested on the connections between plants and fungi. So that that's something that, um, yeah, I definitely love reading into. Um, what are some projects and other research um, that you're either doing right now or you're planning to or you've done in the past? So right now, um... In terms of understanding plant metabolism mm -hmm. and knowing that we need balanced nutrition there, as a grower, one of the principal tools I have is something called plant sap analysis. And, okay. and I, I can get a look at levels of all the different nutrients. And I can use that knowledge during the actual growing season. Like, again, I'm an orchardist. So there are some critical junctures in the plant's life, things like forming a flower, opening a flower, mm. growing a pollen tube, um, being fertilized, setting fruit. And if, if nutrient levels are right, that those processes are gonna go a whole lot smoother and have the kind of result I want without the pests and disease challenges overwhelming that. Mm. And so through plant sap analysis, I can see where levels of calcium are, where levels of iron, uh, oh. where levels of manganese are. And there are foliar formulations I can spray to somewhat hope some of that gets absorbed into the plant sap okay. and improves the situation. But actually more so, and this is also cool, <laughs> it, it almost acts like, it, let's say I spray the manganese. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, some of that gets in, but it also sends a signal down to the biology that, you know, we could use some manganese up here. Oh, <laughs> yo, fungi, cool. yo, bacteria. <laughs> and, and, and we're just, again, starting to learn about this. Um, okay. Thinking in a much deeper way than just kind of blunt, oh, I'm going to push some manganese mm. into this leaf and make it right. better. But I'm, I am doing a deep dive into all this, learning about specific strains of bacteria that can help. Um, mm -hmm. here's, here's another cool for instance, um, iron is in many soils, mm -hmm. but often iron gets oxidized. So think rust. Mm -hmm. Right. And when, when plant takes iron up in an oxidized form, it can't utilize it to make photosynthesis more efficient the way it's meant to. Mm -hmm. It needs to take iron up in a reduced form. So here it's, it's throughout the soil, but oxidation happens. Well, it turns out that there are certain plants, uh, oats, cereal grains are in this group, mm -hmm. that have bacterial partners that produce what are known as siderophores. And siderophores are all about keeping iron in a reduced form. Oh, And that's so nice. when I have a smattering of oats mm -hmm. as part of the plant community around the apple tree, mm -hmm. I have these bacteria which share the reduced iron with my fruit tree, which improves levels of iron that is usable in the growing of apples and peaches and 
and whatever mm. fruit it is that you're growing. Wow. And it, you don't have to know all that. I often tell people, you know, we can go deep and it's fun to go deep. <laughs> and we only that. know a few of the stories. <laughs> um, but what you have to hear coming out of me is, you know, plant diversity. And in this case, a little bit of oats mm -hmm. and something's going to happen that you may not even know was a problem. And your growing is going to improve as a result of that. Right. So is that kind of what diversity. happens? Oops, sorry, you go. Oh, I was just going to say diversity is such a, a cool concept. Right. And I give it an, an adjective. I like to say outrageous diversity. Ooh. And both in the plant community, in the bacterial realm, in the soil, in the fungal, um, the common root being, mm -hmm. the more diversity, the more organisms you have at play, the more niches are filled. Mm -hmm. That's preventing pathogens, bad guys from finding a, a home. But right. more so, it, it's producing this incredible symphony, which is making for a healthy plant realm above more efficient photosynthesis. I mean, mm -hmm. even that term, um, we'll, we'll expand on that a little for your listeners. Yes. We as a human would think, okay, there's a green leaf, there's a green leaf, and there's only so much sunshine. If it's a cloudy day, there's less sunshine. So there's photosynthesis happens, but not much we can do about it. Well, it turns out when the symphony is, mm. is going full bore, and trace minerals are there in the appropriate amounts in the right places that plant metabolism is more robust there's more sugars made that means photosynthesis is indeed mm. becomes more efficient uh, on average photosynthesis runs at probably 20 25 percent of the potential and and when we understand again that through the biology these minerals what are known as enzyme cofactors to help metabolism go better when that's in place, we get more plant sugars, more trade with the fungi, more mm. good minerals. It, it just compounds on itself. Wow. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I did touch on stuff like that um, in a previous episode. So that was definitely one of the references is one of your books that I was like, oh, that's so cool. I want everybody to know about like the plant enzymes and um, how, yeah, it boosts photosynthesis. So thank you for explaining that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, the nitrogen, um, trying to explain, so you were talking about the iron and how it needs to be in a certain um, stage. Is that kind of what's happening with nitrogen and why nitrogen is getting into our water because it's a different form of nitrogen or why is that happening? So the nitrogen thing, mm -hmm. is this is going back a hundred plus years to the whole idea that plants only take nutrients up as soluble ions. Mm -hmm. uh, that the German Lipsick, um, who is considered the father of NPK fertilization, nitrogen, okay. potassium, phosphorus. Um, when we started synthesizing nitrogen mm -hmm. and then using that to grow plants, we created a form of nitrogen that has a, exists in nature mm -hmm. nitrates um but it's not really the prime nitrogen that biology utilizes which okay. would be yep. ammonia now we also synthesize ammonia but when we flood the soil with these synthetically produced nitrogen sources we shut down some of the biology and so this soluble nitrogen becomes something that can come out of the soil as runoff and end up in our waters. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it all goes back to this stupid human decision <laughs> that plants work by sucking up soluble ions without understanding the complexity and beauty of the mm -hmm. biology and the way it's meant to work. And, and this is something um, we really, really need to change. You know, while we're on this subject of yeah. human sins, yeah. <laughs> This is a big species sin of ours. If you fly over the country mm -hmm. um, in fall, winter, early, early spring, and you look down and you see all this fallow ground, ground where the corn and the soybeans and the wheat had been grown the previous year, but mm -hmm. then left fallow. Yep. And left fallow when the sun is shining, meaning there's no green plants sending 
photosynthate sugars down to, to the roots, to the fungi, mm -hmm. who would further the cause by expanding the mycelium, bringing carbon down into the soil. And we basically shut off the photosynthesis engine with yeah. this type of farming. And it's wrong. It's yeah. wrong. It has to change. And so cover cropping after you bring in the corn. Um, mm -hmm. Cover cropping with grazing animals in mind, getting back to a more diversified forms of farming. Uh, this is really, really important. And if, if we're going to change the whole climate change yeah. situation around, um, getting off the synthetic nitrogen mm -hmm. and planting green plants to grow as much as possible throughout every month of the year. And yes, there's winter. Yes, there's snow. Mm -hmm. But every month leading into that and every month as soon as it breaks, that's the way that we're going to heal the earth. Mm. I love that. Um, so you, you were saying that livestock could be a part in helping this? How, how so? Well, proper rotational grazing at the right point in the plant cycle, okay. particularly with grasses, will cause that grass plant to tiller. Mm -hmm. It'll send up more shoots, but it also means it'll send its roots down deeper. And as oh. roots go deeper, fungi go deeper. You know, one, mm. we didn't talk about this, but one of the things that mycorrhizal fungi do, endomycorrhizal fungi do really, really well, is with bacteria, they produce a, um, a protein substance we call glomalin. Okay. And glomalin gives rigidity to the hyphae to move through the soil. Mm. But this whole world of fungal mycelium is kind of a waxing and waning. There's a, a reaching out, there's a reaching back. Mm. And when fungal hyphae leave an area to move over to this area, that glomalin is left behind. What glomalin? Mm. Almost 40% of it is carbon. This is how carbon gets sequestered oh. in the soil. It isn't us with a hypodermic needle pushing <laughs> carbon down. It's plants growing, photosynthesizing, sending sugars with carbon, to the fungi, part of which is used to form this lamellin, mm. that's left behind and it creates humus, which is really good soil, mm -hmm. organic soil, what we call, you know, a farmer uses the word good tilth. That's an indication that this has happened. Mm -hmm. um, it, it goes back to where we started, this idea of plants and fungi forming this union and through photosynthesis, creating sugars, carbon gets in the soil, the earth hums. We broke that cycle. Yeah. We got to fix it. Right. And topsoil um, should be like a really dark um, brown or I guess black or yeah. What should the topsoil that people want? Like what's the oh, color? I don't know people... if there's a should, but okay. <laughs> I think the indicator may not be the color because okay. there's going to be different mineral aspects to that. Yes. Humus is very dark brown. So okay. Generally, we are thinking dark brown, but more it's going to be that crumbly cake texture mm. because another thing that mycorrhizal fungi do <laughs> with the other soil organisms, the bacteria and the sapotrophic, the decomposing fungi, mm -hmm. is this lamellin is used to glue together fine pieces of silt, sand and clay, mm -hmm. and this forms soil aggregates. Got it. And the more soil aggregate formation, means the more fine organic particles are going to be tucked away mm -hmm. in those par um, aggregates, mm -hmm. which is going to help with water infiltration, which is going to help with um, providing sheltered communities for microbes to live. Um, this is what makes that nice crumbly soil texture. Um, so more than the color, it's, okay. it's seeing aggregates. When you, when you do dig up a, a plant and you see soil clinging to the roots mm -hmm. and little clusters, you know, that's, that's an indication that's right good. there okay. that the plant and the fungi together are doing really, really good work. Nice. They're bonding. <laughs> um, your book talked about mycofracking. Can you explain a little bit about that? That's, that's a concept I haven't used, but I am okay. familiar with people using it. Let's say, um, even more so landscapers. I, I, I have been talking with an orchardist in Germany who's used this. But here the idea is that 
by basically taking prongs and going a little bit deeper than the surface and maybe we're going eight inches down, 10 inches, 12 inches. Um, you can inject biology. So part of that would be oh, mycorrhizal spores. And, and this is a way of, without disturbing the surface of the, the ground, mm -hmm. getting some of that biology deeper down to where the roots are, particularly with landscape trees, to rekindle some of these connections oh, okay. that may be lost to soil compaction or whatever that history of that land. That this, this is just a technique of, yes, I like that phrase, rekindling the biology. OK, OK. And there's other ways. We, I mean, when we talked about inoculum in the potting soil or, or going out to a healthy ecosystem and getting some soil from around the roots, that's going to bring spores back and you plant it or put it at the base of an apple tree you planted two years ago, but you didn't know about mycorrhizal fungi at mm. the time, so you never introduced inoculum then. Okay. You can get some of, you can jumpstart the connections, which can take years and years to establish okay. otherwise. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I heard you uh, on a podcast once talking about how to, how does one think like a tree? <laughs> Can you explain what you mean by how does one think like a tree or how could one think like a tree? So th this is about empathy. This is about your spirit and your heart, who you really are. Mm -hmm. So in, in one sense, our culture knows um, the phrase, he, she has a green thumb. Mm. And someone with a green thumb can grow great plants. Well, it isn't that they have some like special knowledge. It's, it's more or less that they're thinking about plant things mm. <laughs> like water and, and yeah. is it cold, is it hot? And, and they're taking care of the environment for that plant so it grows well. And um, I think, a lot of my herbal friends are are definitely plant people. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, you know I'm going beyond the thumb. I'm not claiming yeah. the whole body in this discussion. Yeah. But a, a plant person just has an awareness of and an appreciation of, mm -hmm. of what it means to be a plant and work with that energy and help that plant, help, help things grow. And I think a tree person just takes it a little bit further, <laughs> go way out on a limb. Okay. And um, the, the, we feel that connection, you know, going back to mm -hmm. the, the Celtic traditions, to the Druids, um, honoring trees, again, that word appreciation, mm -hmm. loving trees, loving plants. Um, and, and it just becomes like, okay, now let's, let's bring that inner wisdom forward and be very practical and say, now where should I plant an apple tree? Well, what would the, how would the apple tree answer that? It would answer it where I can find the right fungal friends, where I can find the right biology. And as you study these things, you will learn that in the soil food web, in the biomass of microbes in the soil, in a, very, in a, a disturbed soil situation, let's say a monocropped cornfield, compacted, herbicided for years and years, mm -hmm. or a suburban lot where the... Um, topsoil has been stripped away. That's a very bacterial place. So okay. bacteria are good. They're part of the road to recovery, right. but we also want the fungal piece. And as you get into the old growth forest where there's been no disturbance, mm -hmm. fungal biomass will be as much as a hundred times greater than the bacterial biomass. Whoa. And it turns out that right on the edge of the forest where an apple tree could find sunshine, mm -hmm. Fungal biomass will be approximately 10 times greater than the bacterial biomass. And, and that's what the tree would tell you. I want to right. grow with it. The, the fungal biomass mm -hmm. is 10 times greater than the bacterial. But now the tree's not, that apple tree's not telling you, I want to grow on the edge of the forest. Right. It's saying, I want you to create an edge of the forest ecosystem oh. wherever you put me. And, and now we're getting into what I call fungal duff management. And again, okay. it's, you know, it's, it's just another term I've created to put the emphasis on the fungal piece. Um, and now it's about fungal foods. Mm -hmm. So um, wood chips, uh, aged compost, those fatty acids. Mm -hmm. You know, we're back to my talking about how do I grow tree fruit, fruit tree fruit holistically. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm 
encouraging and abetting that fungal duff around these fruit trees. And, and you can do this, every plant has, again, when I say 90% of the plants have this affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi, that mm -hmm. should tell you in general, you wanna create some fungal yeah. condition. Definitely. <laughs> with pretty fruiting perennials, I wanna make it on the order of 10 to one. And I'm not measuring that, mm -hmm. but you know, my, my soul, my capacity to intuit and imagine puts myself into the tree mind mm. and understands that's what's going on at the edge of the forest. If I emulate that, that's going to make for a happy tree mm. and a happy tree makes for a happy tree person. And that's me. Yes, I agree. I'm definitely a plant person too. <laughs> um, what does your typical day look like uh, for Michael right now? This is the time of the year when I am pruning and will soon be planting trees and we're getting garden plants growing and there's very many things to do. And yeah. there was, we're, Northern New Hampshire, like I said, this morning, we woke up to a half inch of snow and that, that always relaxes me because then I'm not feeling like, oh, I got to get out there and everything's going to be green in a week. Right, right. You know, but I'm in this transition phase and, and mm. there are many things to do. Mm. Okay. Um, so yeah, how do you stay motivated to keep trekking on for all of your projects since you are fairly busy? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a love of what I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm also, I've been a carpenter. Um, okay. I do less of that now, except for here on our farmhouse and I'm building a cidery. So oh, wow. a snowy rainy day, I have that to do. Oh, I, nice. I think it's a question of plunging in in the morning on something okay. you definitely want to get done that day. So you don't get distracted by all the other things. And so it, by the end of the day, you did actually accomplish something mm. on your list. Okay. Even if you don't make a list. Yeah. I, I love doing all these different things. It's it's just I need to be able to focus mm. um, to really get into what the one thing I'm doing at a time. I can think about other things, right. but I, I have to achieve some of my goals in the process of, of being Michael. <laughs> ah, I see. And that's how you kind of stay successful is, you know, get at least something done in the day, early in the morning. Um, early in the morning is the most productive time. Good things I, get done in the afternoon, but they're, they're not always um, what I had in mind. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Get a little distracted. I like that. Um, yeah, tell me about a time where you questioned your future within this field. And how did you overcome the obstacle? Well, I don't know that I questioned this particular okay. field. Um, you know, I, I could tell you that uh, I have a degree in civil engineering. Okay. I went to Penn State and I did pretty good at it. And I, I got a job outside of Washington, D.C. and I was on a construction crew and doing things like massive culverts into the Potomac River and et cetera. And I, I knew that that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I, I had the knowledge and I liked the knowledge. It was mm -hmm. useful, but I wasn't working with my hands. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I did it for like 10 months and then I retired at age 23. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what? How did that serendipitous, work? <laughs> the serendipitous path to discover I'm a tree person and get my hands in the earth and do all the things that I do. Wow. Well, retiring at age 23 is, is just a joke. There is no pension plan <laughs> or anything, but, <laughs> but I made a big transition because mm -hmm. I recognized this was not me. This was a career path that I'd been partly guided into. Mm. I had the skill sets to do, but it wasn't who I really, it wasn't, it didn't make my heart song. Right. Um, heart sing. We, we call our farm, the medicinal herb part, portion of our farm, heart song farm, which is kind okay. of reflecting that experience. Um, and I, I think I'm one of the lucky ones, you know, it's, we're all on these different paths mm -hmm. and not everyone finds what makes their heart sing. Yeah. And it's, it's an important, it's a gift. It's yeah. a gift to find that spot. And I'm in that spot for me. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, 
if you had unlimited resources, what research would you want to look into? Well, I, me I mentioned the thing with plant sap analysis, mm, yep. um, you know, and, and so I'm doing three rounds of that in the growing season with two different types of varieties. Okay. And that's a slow pace to learn things, but mm -hmm. you learn what you learn and then you make some discoveries and then you shape the next year's things that you want to test. And so I can do some comparison trials. Um, I guess I'd, I'd like to have a little bit more um, microscope knowledge Ooh. because I get to see these things because other people take pictures. Right. And I, I've looked through a microscope and I can see some movement, but mm -hmm. I don't have that knowledge base to like look at what is the colonization on this surface of the leaf as a result of uh, me doing this. Okay. That would be really neat yeah, to be able to tie that nice. together better. And I, and I didn't do that training. I have yeah. civil engineer training. Right. right. I know the stresses on a beam and a, a post and beam barn <laughs> and why it needs to be 10 by 10 instead of six by six. Right. Um, huh. But anyway, I'm, to the degree I can, I pick up things from other people, but I, I think a lot could be learned um, if I had more of a um, research farm and a knowledge base and, and the uh, budget okay, to pursue yeah. it and have yeah. some people helping me do that. Yeah. I think I have the right ideas Okay. and I'm pecking away at it, but I, I think that that more could be done with that. Okay, so you kind of think that could be a future uh, project or? Or are you just kind well, of I'm doing, doing it, it but oh, I, I'm, oh, okay, I'm doing it at my own limited pace. Um, got it. I got it. But that's okay. also, you know, part of my world is connecting with other fascinating people. And mm -hmm. if we're thinking fungally, we're, we're forming a mycelium. Yes, <laughs> where mycelial network. We're sharing these ideas and, you know, and, and it's not just in these current times. You find mm -hmm. lots of great um, thinking a, a generation ago two generations ago you know it's it never became the main dominant thought in our mm -hmm. society or culture but there are people who've made these discoveries and now we're just adding to it okay. sometimes we're just simply rediscovering what they knew right um, right but, it, hmm. but it's fun and it's good and and we need lots more people doing this kind of work because mm -hmm. we need to figure out how to live sustainably regeneratively yeah. on this planet yeah agreed so is that what you think your biggest fear with this uh, field of study is? Is that uh, something with like sustainability or people won't ever catch on to correct farming or? I don't know that I have a fear of it. Okay. Um, I'll be blunt. If, if we as a culture and a society and as a species don't catch on, as you use the term, to mm -hmm. biological farming, we as a culture and a species don't have too much more time on this mm. planet. Yeah. Hmm. So I mean, that is something I could fear, but yeah. it's, it's, as far as it taking off, it's like, I'm, I'm just part of the knowledge base. We have the knowledge mm -hmm. of what to do. I may not be the communicator mm -hmm. to convince many, many people to do it, but this is a very decentralized healing, so to mm -hmm. speak. And it's out there and there, there are many people doing this we just need more of them we need that yeah. hundredth person to make the right full momentum reality okay. I like that. And, and i'd prefer to see us do it by choice mm -hmm. rather than disaster and ecosystem turnover um make it a much more painful journey but right that that is beyond my hands and your hands <laughs> exactly um so what are you most excited for than in your field of study? Well, I, you know, someone said, um, you have like 50, 60 years to do your thing and figure it out. <laughs> and, you know, that's not many years, you know, mm -mm. I'm thinking like a tree. So I, yeah. it's like, why don't I have 500 years? <laughs> um, but each spring, I just find myself filled with enthusiasm. Um, and I want to make the most of that one mm -hmm. 50th of a ticket to learn and discover and do things a little bit better to make oh. this earth, this soil, this farm a better place, mm. better than I found it. I like that. Um, so how do you think people can make a difference with flora and fungi? Um, 
or how can flora and fungi influence the future? Well, I, I think as your listeners have been hearing you know, this enthusiasm about how the plant world works with the fungal world mm -hmm. um, to create this collaboration, these support networks. Um, we have both those teachings to inspire us and in all the things that we do, mm -hmm. but hopefully some of the plant people out there, the tree people out there, the fungal people out there are recognizing hearings, um, thinking about things that they can do to make the place, the spot where they are healthier, uh, a place where green plants photosynthesize and get carbon in the soil through their fungal friends. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't have big picture answers. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not a politician. I don't want to be a politician. <laughs> what I want to be is a, a good earth steward. Yeah. And that's what we need to inspire among more and more of our number being good earth stewards. And right. the floral fungal piece, uh, as you start to learn about it, mm -hmm. is total motivation to do mm -hmm. that. Perfect, I like that. And do you have any resources that I can put in the show notes um, for people to learn more about, I guess, you um, or holistic farming or uh, mycorrhizal fungi besides uh, your own books, which I will definitely already put in the show notes below, so. Uh, I would just point people to the, the, the two websites. So okay. lostnationorchard.com is our okay. orchard website. And you'll read a little bit about me as a writer and a speaker mm -hmm. there. And then the network website, groworganicapples.com, that's got worldwide roots now. Um, this is a big mycelium. Ooh. And this is fruit growers um, figuring out together how to grow in healthier ways. and And the lessons are applicable to anyone growing whatever it is that's their thing. Um, you know, our conversations are again around fruit trees, mm -hmm. but it, healthy soil, the fungal dynamics, all that pulls in there. So that's woven into our discussion forum, which okay. we have opened up so anyone can see. Oh, perfect. And there is a bookshelf uh, on both websites. So okay. you can get signed copies of my books directly from oh, me. Yes. And yeah, let awesome. people know. Awesome. Yeah, I will definitely do that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and finally getting to talk about Mycorrhizal Planet and getting to know a little bit more about you. So um, do you have anything else that you want to say or anything that I did not ask you? I don't know. I think you emptied me of all my wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That was the goal. <laughs> Oh. I'll need to replenish. <laughs> yeah, no recharge. But no, I've enjoyed this conversation with you. So thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. And, yeah. um, perfect. Go do fungal things. Yes, perfect. Go hug a tree or stand outside, photosynthesize. All right. Well, yeah, I think, uh, don't think I have any other questions. And if you need help with anything, uh, I can show up within a day. So let me know if you need help with any, <laughs> any, anything. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, nice right. meeting you. Yeah. Nice meeting you too. Bye. Have a great day. See ya. Bye.